we're glad that you're here. I, um, I'm going to be beginning a, a brand new Christmas series next week and uh, talking about the reason why Jesus came. This morning, I, I want you to take your Bibles. We're going to open up Luke chapter 2, and, and you're going to read, hear me reading a lot and speaking a lot from these different Christmas passages over the next few weeks because really, this is kind of the only time of the year typically we do. Usually, you don't hear somebody preaching from these passages in, in May or July or August. This is usually all around this season, so just prepare yourself to, to hear these passages again and again, but I believe that every, every week during this season, I think God can speak to us directly about some very important things, but I, I'm speaking this morning on a message I've simply entitled Making Room because today is about preparing ourselves. We are entering into the Christmas season, and so it really is about preparing our hearts for everything that God would have for us during this month so that we would be in the right place mentally and, and spiritually, emotionally to, to receive and, and to be used of God during this time of the year. So really that's what we're talking about today. We're talking about making room, preparing ourselves for what God has in store for us and so what we can do to be prepared. So if you have your Bibles, Luke chapter 2, I'm going to read from verse 1. It says this, at that time, the Roman Emperor Augustus, he decreed that a census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire. And this first census was taken when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all returned to their ancestral towns to register for the census. And because Joseph was a descendant of King David, he had to go to Bethlehem in Judea, David's ancient home. And he traveled there from the village of Nazareth in Galilee. And he took with him Mary, his fiancée, who was now obviously pregnant. And while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her first child, a son, and she wrapped him snugly in strips of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no lodging available to them. The King James, our new King James, says it in a way I think most of us are familiar with when it says, because there was no room for them in the inn. Making room. I love the story about the grandma who had taken her two grandkids to go shopping with them. Her grandkids were four. Jason was four. Susie was three. She had taken them to the store and then the mall, and she had been up and down the store till she, she was totally exhausted. She was worn out and tired, and she was just thinking, I've got to get back to the car. I'm ready just to go back home. So she finally gets Jason in and, and Susie in, and she's getting ready to load Susie in. Jason, her four-year-old grandson, looks at her, and he says, he says Susie has something in her pocket. And he reached down into Susie's pocket and he pulled out a brand new red bracelet. And, and of course, Grandma knew that that wasn't Susie's bracelet, that Susie must have picked that up in that last store that they were been in. Grandma was tired. She didn't really want to go back in the store, but she thought this would be a great teaching moment for her grandkids and thought she needed to do this. And so she got Jason out of the car, got Susie out of the car, went back into the store, and uh, she had the Susie, you know, put it back where she'd got it, told the store, we're so sorry, manager. They went back and got finally back in the car. It was a great teaching moment for Grandma and the kids. They're headed to the house, and she realizes we got to buy some groceries, don't have nothing hardly at the house. So she swings by the grocery store on the way home. She runs into the store, got Jason and Susie in tow, throwing things in the buggy. She gets to the cash register to check out. She's totally tired, and they're in the cash line to pay and to go out. And the, the attendant behind the register, she looks down at the sweet little Jason and Susie. She says, they see, she says, oh, y'all been good for Grandma. Santa going to come see you this year? And I love it because Jason, he, he looked at her, and she, he says, I've been very, very good. He says, but my sister, she just robbed a store. <laughs> You know, Christmas season really is officially upon. This is December 1. Thanksgiving's already passed, and Pastor Steve mentioned Black Friday uh, just a few minutes ago, and I don't know how many, I would lift your hand and say you got out on Black Friday and went shopping, but I'm sure some of you probably did. I know my, my wife and kids did. Crazy. I mean, people are, it's crazy out there on Black Friday. I drove. Finding a parking spot was like a gift from God on Black Friday. I mean, it's crazy out there. And we weren't even in town. We were up in Missouri, and it was cold, and it was wet, and it was still. I, I was thinking I was going to be out there. There's not going to be anybody out there because it's cold and wet. And it was madness out there. And so when I backed in, my wife and kids are out there because everybody's looking for the perfect gift at the perfect price. And uh, I, I didn't get out. I stayed in the car. 
I stayed in the where it was safe and warm and dry with my grandson Jude. We stayed in the car, let them go out. And I say that very real, warm and, and dry because it was cold and rainy, but safe because people are crazy. It's amazing what people will do at Christmas time. I mean, I saw somewhere there was an online video where these two women, I think it was in Pennsylvania somewhere, they were going fist to cuffs at 2.30 in the morning. Somewhere they have forgotten that this is supposed to be the most wonderful time of the year. This is supposed to be about peace on earth and goodwill towards men because this is the season that Jesus came. And yet, here they are, fist to cuff and slapping each other, pulling the hair. And I'm thinking, is that what Christmas is all about? But that's what it is for a lot of people. I mean, crazy things. People going here and there. I, I, for me, staying in car is always the safest bet. Listen, when this time of year comes around, I'm always amazed at how people act. I'm always amazed at how people react. What people will do and say, all in the banner of Christmas. What even amazes us even more is how busy we become. I mean, some, there's something about this time of the year that we would get so busy. I mean, it's like we're going 100 miles an hour. We're going to, to Christmas parties, and we're going to programs, and we're going to this activity and this family gathering. And listen, there's nothing wrong with any of those things. I love all of them. The point I would simply make is that we're so involved celebrating the holiday of Christmas that we forget about what Christmas really is, the meaning of Christmas. So we have the, the holiday of the season, and we're so busy celebrating it that we forget the real reason behind the reason we're celebrating Listen, as excited as some of you may or may not be, it's important that we remember that this year's celebration of Christmas is not celebrating a fat man in a red velvet suit. This is about celebrating the fact that God sent his only begotten son wrapped in swallowing clothes and laying in a manger. I heard the story that comes out of the country of Wales back in the 80s, 1980s, about a man who for 42 years tried to win the affection of a certain lady. 42 years, he asked her to marry him. And finally, in the 43rd year, she said yes. They were 74 years old, but she finally said yes. <laughs> but think about this. For 42 years, he would write a love letter every week and slip it under his neighbor's door, expressing his love and his desire to marry her. And for 42 years, she never once responded to a single letter he wrote. Finally, after 2,200 love letters in the 43rd year, he finally mustered enough courage to go in person. So he goes over, knocks on the door. She opens the door, and he finally expresses face-to-face -face his love for her. And he says, will you marry me? And she said, yes. And you know what the reason was? It's because he had finally had the courage to do it in person. Listen, 2,000 years ago, God chose to do more than send us a love letter. God chose to come in the flesh and tell us face to face, wrapped in swallowing clothes, beginning in a manger. But he grew up and he told us that he loved us. And that changes absolutely everything. Listen, we're talking about the Christmas season. We're talking about preparing our hearts for what's to come. And the Bible says in Luke chapter 2 that Joseph and Mary, they go to Bethlehem because that's the ancestral town to be registered together for the census. And while they're there, the Bible says that Mary was going to give birth and she's going to be delivered. But they went to the inn and the innkeeper said, there's no room here. So she gave birth to that child in a stable, wrapped him in swallowing clothes, laid him in a manger because there was no lodging available or there was no room in the inn. Listen, there are no words like those two words, no room, that have stirred and convicted and challenged all of our hearts year after year after year for thousands of years. Because why? Because it's indicative of our character. It's indicative of human nature where we say to God, I don't really have room for you. I really don't have room. See, the question that we're asking ourselves as we're moving into this season once again is this, is there enough room as we celebrate that he has a place there? Is there room for him in here? I want to give us three things real quickly that we need to be careful of this Christmas season 
as we're preparing to celebrate Jesus. The first thing is this. We need to be careful that we don't allow the busyness, the busyness of the season to crowd him out. Because guess what? We can get really busy, can't we? I love the, the book of Max Licato, A Pause from Heaven. Licato's a great writer, a great author. And he tells in this book, he tells a story about a, uh, an Indian legend uh, from, from the country of India about the Shah there who was deciding one day he was going to build a massive cathedral, a memorial to his deceased second wife. He began the project in 1631. It took him 22 years to build it, 20,000 workers working on it. Still 22 years to build this memorial for his wife that he loved. He thought to himself, this would be a way to show the world how much I loved her. So he got a big parcel of land. He took her remains, which was in a wood box, and he put it in the middle of the, in the, middle of the, project, of the project, and he began to build this massive memorial around her, the Taj Mahal. But as the weeks rode into months, rode into years, he became so engrossed in the building of the project that he forgot why he was building it. And the legend goes like this, that one day, years later, because it takes 22 years to build it. One day, years later, he was walking from one side of the project to the other side of the project in the evening. And he hit his leg on a box. He looked down and it irritated him and it aggravated him. So he dust the dust off of his leg. And he told his workers, take the box and throw it out. Forgetting that that box was where his wife's remains were at. And Lakato says this at the end of that story. He says this. Thus... The one for whom the temple was being built had been cast out. The one who had inspired the whole project was forgotten. The one the temple was intended to honor had been harshly pushed aside, absent-mindedly thrown away, and blatantly ignored. I read that, and I realize that sometimes that's us. That we can become so involved in the task and the details of Christmas that we forget the one that we're actually supposed to be honoring. We're so caught up in the hustle and the bustle of the projects, the intricacies of planning and preparation, the shopping and the wrapping, and the going here and the there that we forget the why and the who that the season is all about. We're so busy going and doing that we run ourselves to exhaustion to the point where we become irritable, we become aggravated and frustrated. And instead of enjoying the Christmas season, we're just ready next week for it to be over. And what's happened is that we've allowed the busyness of the season to crowd him out. And we might as well put a sign on the doorpost of our heart that says to God, no room, no room here, too busy here. There's no room for Jesus here. I'm too busy with what I'm doing. Why? Because our schedules are that way. We need to be careful that the business of the season doesn't keep us from making room for our hearts for him. That it doesn't keep us from remembering who this season is really all about. Be careful of the busyness. Here's the second thing. We need to be careful that the callousness of our hearts doesn't keep him out. It's easy to get callous at life, isn't it? Callous towards people. You know, you get calluses on your hands. If you work with your hands, slinging a hammer, doing something else with your hands, or you, somebody lifts weights, or, or you wear a certain size shoes that may be a little bit too small, but you keep wearing those shoes anyway, and you, put, you develop those... Those, those hard places, those old calluses, or your guitar player, your fingers, because you're mad. What's happening is that you're inflicting pain. It's the pain, it's the sharp points that are being applied again and again and again. And what happens is that calluses develop. They develop in your palms, they develop on your fingers, they develop on your feet, they develop on your knees if you're always on your knees. Why? Because you're always inflicting some kind of pain or pressure upon it. And that's what happens in life. As we're pushing against people all the time, because even though the love of Jesus abides in us and Christ lives in us, because we're always coming in contact with people and people are rubbing this the wrong way here and they're rubbing us the wrong way there, we become callous towards others and we may not even realize it, but it's true, we become callous. I heard a lady about a lady by the name of Harriet. Her and her family had attended a Christmas Eve service at church. She said after church, her family was driving home and they were hungry, so they decided they wanted to stop and get a late-night breakfast, but the only place that was open was this truck stop near the highway. She said it was a, a moment in her life where she truly experienced the real essence of Christmas. 
She said we pulled in. She said there was some 18-wheelers out there rumbling in the parking lot. She went inside. There were some truckers sitting at the counter ordering their food. She said the place smelled like bacon grease and stale cigarettes. She said there was some twinkling lights, some ragtag lights kind of stuck to the window over there. And man with one arm behind the counter, she said it was a pitiful looking group. Wouldn't for a place. And finally the waitress, a real thin waitress by the name of Rita, she came and she said, they, she said that she helped them find the little booth and they got in. She gave them a weary smile, gave them their menus and they, they sat down at the booth and she began to bring them a cup of coffee. And, and, and all this time there was a jukebox that was playing in the background, some kind of country music that said something worse to the effect like this. Uh, walk backwards going out so it looks like you're coming in. I don't know. Country music. <laughs> Crazy words make you cry. I don't know. Some kind of crazy, and, and she said that she was sitting there looking at this room of people and the smells and everything. And she said she felt like a snob because she said she felt so out of place. In fact, she said that she was thinking to herself that one day she said, We'll look back on this situation, we're gonna laugh. We're going to say to ourselves, you remember that Christmas, that after the Christmas Eve service, that we ate breakfast at that truck stop, that awful music, those tacky lights, those pitiful people? She said that's what she was thinking when a little Volkswagen pulled up outside the window and she saw a guy get out with a pair of blue jeans on and a beard and walk around to the other side and open the door and his wife got out with her little baby boy, came inside the truck stop and the little baby boy, he was upset. Rita got them to a little table, and they sat down, and they're just trying to get the baby to stop crying. And, and finally, Rita says, you want me to take him for you? Let me take him, hon. And she takes him. Y'all drink your coffee. Now she's got him. She's bouncing around. She could tell that she had done this. She's bouncing him around. I'm getting used to doing that again at my house, you know, bouncing him around. <laughs> She's bouncing around. She goes up to the truckers that are sitting at the counter, and they're making all kinds of googly faces and whistling and Takes him over to the lights, swing on the, and the baby stops crying. She's just kind of bouncing. She comes back over to their table, and she says, look at this sweet little baby boy. He's good looking, isn't he? She says, mine are all grown now. She walked away. The man with one arm came over, and he refilled their coffee pots, their coffee cups. And... Harriet said that she felt the tear begin forming in her eyes. She reached out into her purse to get a clean X and a quarter. She gave the kids the quarter. She says, go find a Christmas song in that jukebox if you can. She's looking, just looking out across the room at her husband. He sees, he sees a welling up of tears in her eyes. He says, what's wrong, honey? What's wrong? And she said, it's just Christmas. It's just Christmas. And finally she said, Jesus would come here, wouldn't he? He says, what do you mean? She says, if, if Jesus would come, she says, he'd come here, wouldn't he? She's looking at the room. She's already assessing that these people probably aren't going back to homes with Trees in the windows and wreaths on the doors. And she's assessed the room and she says, she says, he would come here, wouldn't he? he? He wouldn't come to our neighborhood. He wouldn't come to our church. He would come here, wouldn't he? And he said, you're probably right. She'd gone to that place and she had looked at the tacky lights and she looked at the people and she had already assessed them. She had already judged them. Too harshly. And looking at it all, she says, Jesus would come here. If he was born tonight, he would be born here. Not in our neighborhood. Not at our church. But here. And then she said, now I think more than any place, I know this is where Christmas is. But she says, but now I think I don't belong. And her sweet husband put his arm around her and he said to her honey remember what the angel said I bring good news of great joy to all
Listen, Jesus came for everyone. It doesn't matter the color of our skin, the language that we speak, or the place that we call home. It makes no difference how much money we make or we don't make. It doesn't matter what titles or awards we may have won. Jesus came for all of us. Listen, Christmas should make us look at the world differently, not through hearts and eyes that have been calloused by life. Where we look at people coldly and harshly and judge them too quickly. But we should see them with the eyes of Jesus who sent his son wrapped in swallowing clothes lying in a major wine. Because he loves every single person you come in contact with. Who first announced his coming to the lowliest of individuals. To shepherds keeping watch over their flocks by night. The ones that everyone despised. That's who he announced his birth to. First to shepherds. Listen, Christmas should remind us. That Jesus came for everybody, the homeless, the drunk, the drug addict, the prostitute, the destitute, the sick, the hurting. He came for that annoying man and that irritating woman in line in front of you. He came for that teenager chomping their gum and trying to text all the time they're trying to check you out. He came for that person who drives 35 at a 65. (laughs) He came for all of us. Red, yellow, black, white, we are all precious in God's sight. So instead of being short with people, instead of becoming irritated and aggravated and frustrated because we think they're slow or they're inept, and, and because we got to remember who they are, they're, they're the people that Jesus came for. We cannot allow the, the busyness of life keep him out. We cannot allow the, the callousness of life shut him out. And lastly, we need to be careful that our own preoccupation with self doesn't shut him out. It's so easy to become preoccupied with self. One of my wife's favorite Christmas movies is The Bishop's Wife. Great movie, black and white. David Niven plays the Episcopal priest. Cary Grant plays the the angel Dudley. But the story is about this priest who becomes so preoccupied with building a new cathedral that he begins to neglect the things that are important to him. begins to neglect his family. He begins to... Even forget why he had become a priest in the first place because he's so preoccupied, kind of like the emperor who building the Taj Mahal for his wife. He's so preoccupied with what he's doing that he's forgetting the reason why he's doing it. So finally in desperation, he prays to God for help and God sends him an angel by the name of Dudley who comes to help, but he doesn't help him the way that he wants him to help him. It's funny, but it's got some great truths in it because it reminds us of what's true and what's important in our lives. But at the very end, the closing scene of the film, David Niven, who is the priest, is going to deliver the Christmas message. And he's written a message, but what he doesn't realize is that Dudley, the angel, has gone back and rewritten it himself. And he gets up, and I want to read the message that he delivered. You'll let me quote from a movie. It begins like this. Tonight I want to tell you the story of an empty stocking. Once upon a midnight clear, there was a child's cry. A blazing star hung over a stable, and wise men came with birthday gifts. We haven't forgotten that night down through the centuries. We celebrate it with stars on Christmas trees, with the sounds of bells, and with gifts, and especially with gifts. If you give me a book, I give you a tie. Aunt Martha has always wanted an orange squeeze, or an Uncle Henry can do with a new pipe. We forget nobody, adult or child. All the stockings are filled, all that is except for one. And we've even forgotten to hang it up. The stocking for the child born in a manger. It's his birthday we're celebrating. Don't ever let us forget that. Let us ask ourselves what we would wish for most. And then let us each put in his share. Loving kindness, warm hearts, and a stretched out hand of tolerance. All the shining gifts that make peace on earth. I think it's important that we remember that Christmas isn't about us. No, no, don't get me wrong. It's God's gift to us. But it's not about us in the sense that we totally forget who he is. Christmas is really about Jesus coming to us. And we've got to be careful that we don't allow the, the busyness or the coldness or the callousness of life or the preoccupation with our own agendas keep us from taking the time to remember what this season is about and who it's about. It's about Jesus. It's about preparing our hearts to receive him anew. It's about acknowledging his presence in, his, in our lives and in our world. It's to recognize that because of Jesus, our world is forever changed. It's because of Jesus. Listen, you read the story in Luke chapter 2 of Joseph and Mary 
coming to this inn and seeking a room and being turned away, it, that, that image is forever ingrained in our minds because we see this innkeeper as being this rough individual with no feeling and no heart sitting in the way. Why? Because he's too busy, he's too callous, and he's too preoccupied with himself to realize that there's a man standing out there with a woman who's about to give birth. So that image is there. And as soon as we read the story, that's what we see. This rough, mean innkeeper, so busy, so callous, so preoccupied that he misses the fact that before him is the Christ child about to be born. And yet every single year, all of us can be guilty of doing the same things in our hearts if we're not careful. We can go go so busy with the holiday that we forget Jesus. We can become so callous at people that, and then we're in the stores and somebody gets in front of us and they cut us off and say something we don't like and, and all of a sudden we have this thing that just flares up because we're calloused and cold at life right. and forget that Jesus came for them too. Right. And we're just so preoccupied with our agendas that we miss the most important door. Listen, the truth is that Jesus was forever at the door knocking. The innkeeper said, there's no room. But Jesus is still at the door knocking. He's no longer a baby, but now he's a full-grown man, the resurrected king. But he's still at the door knocking because he says in Revelation 3, verse 20, look, he says, I stand at the door and knock, and if you will hear my voice and open the door, I will come in, and we will share a meal together as friends. He's standing there. He's knocking. The problem is that the world is still saying, no room, no room, no room. question I have for us today is will you make room will you make room for Jesus do you have room in your heart enough for him to come in because I can tell you if you allow him to come in he will transform you from the inside out he makes us new again he's still at the door he's still knocking the question is what are we answering do you have enough room for him will you make room I'm closing with this. I've shared this story lots of times because it is one of my favorites. It's about a guy, a little boy by the name of William Sterling. William was a seventh grader. Big for his age. A little bit slow in learning, but sweet boy. Everybody liked him. And They were having a Christmas program at the church, and William wanted to be the, the shepherd, but they just looked at him, and they thought, you know what, you know, your size, I think you would probably be a really good innkeeper. We're going to make you the innkeeper, William. So we're going to give you a line. All you have to say is no room, but say it rough. No room. So that's what he's going to do. Practice it. He got it down. So the night of the program comes. Church is packed. Parents, grandparents, everybody's filled the whole building. Mary and Joseph, they come to the door. They knock on the door. He opens it. Joseph says, do you have room? And he says this, William says this part perfectly. No room. The problem was, it's not really a problem, the thing is that Joseph, he got a little into the part too. <laughs> Joseph said, but please, sir, this is my wife. She's expecting, going to give birth any time. Please, you got to have a place to stay. No room. Again, Joseph, you don't understand, sir. She really needs a place to stay. She really needs to stay. She's about to have a baby. And something kind of snapped in William. And he just kind of paused because he was thinking about what he was saying. You ever been in one of those plays when somebody's on the stage and you know they're supposed to say their line and there's a pause and they're not saying it and you almost feel embarrassed for them or you kind of anxious for them like, Ugh. and you're praying, God, help them remember, help them remember. I've been both. I've been the guy on the platform who forgot the line. I've been the people in the audience saying, oh, Jesus, help them remember the line. That's everybody in the audience as he's standing there looking at it. The prompter in the back is trying to tell him, tell him no, no, tell him to go, just to go. And finally he looks at him. William says, no room. Be gone. But he didn't say it rough. He was just real soft. 
And so Mary and Joseph turned around and they started to walk away and just something snapped in William. William looked at him and says, no, stop, stop. Come back. You stay in my room. I'll sleep in the shed. The director of the program, she thought the play was ruined until she realized that what William said is the truth for all of us. That we need to open up our hearts and let him stay in here. We'll sleep in the shed. Give him room in here. Friends, don't allow the busyness. Don't allow the callousness of life. Don't allow your preoccupation with your own agenda. Shut Jesus out. Make room for him. He'll come in and he'll change your world if you'll just open it up. Jesus, you can stay in here. I'll sleep in the shed. Just don't leave me. Don't pass me by. Stay in my heart. Aren't you glad? Listen, we're, we're just starting Christmas season. This is December 1. Stores are already packed. I've seen it. And there's going to be these people that are going to be rubbing against you and it's going to frustrate you. You're going to be going here and there and everywhere. Some of you are going to be wishing that Christmas was over. But the reason you're feeling that way is because we've somehow distorted and misplaced where Jesus is. Don't throw him out. Honor him. Be careful of the busyness. Be careful of the callousness. Be careful of the preoccupation with self. Put Jesus in his rightful place. Make room for him. It'll make Christmas awesome this year. Would you do that? Stand together. God, I love you. I love you, Jesus. I thank you, Lord. God, help us to keep you in the central place during this season, but not just this season, every day, all throughout the year. Help us to open up our hearts and to open up our lives. You stand at the door, you're knocking, and you said that you'll come in, you'll have sweet fellowship, relationship. It would just open the door and make room. Lord, I just pray for every family and every person, every individual. God, when we find ourselves so busy, God, when we find ourselves being so callous, when we find ourselves being too preoccupied with our agenda, God, help us to be reminded of what's being said here. To step and take a step back and remember that Christmas is a celebration that you came. More than a love letter, you came in person. For God so loved the world that he gave his son that whosoever believes in him, they will not perish but have everlasting life. Because of you, Lord, our world has changed. And we're so thankful for that. I love you, Jesus.